Hello, this is Mona Tonchev, past president of NCSM, and welcome to the NCSM podcast, Learning with Leaders, the Reset, Renew, Restore series. Join me and my co-host, John San Giovanni, as we sit down and have conversations with emerging and established leaders about how we can reset for the upcoming school year. Listen as we talk to mathematics leaders who can help us think about resetting what has become status quo these past few years. We will learn about their inspiration, perceptions, insights, and perspective. Listeners, fellow mathematics leaders, if you feel like current math instructional practices or student learning seems stuck or stalled, it's time to hit reset. Hello, listeners. I am Mona Tonjev, and welcome to the NCSM podcast, Learning with Leaders. Our final podcast in this series is going to help us reset, renew, and restore as we prepare for the second half of the 22-23 school year. That's right, Mona. This series is a chance to think about, well, a brighter future. It's a chance to think about what has worked, what hasn't, and to think about the pressure to catch up, but, but without taking shortcuts. So today our guest is Dr. Ilana Horn, who goes by Lani. Um, she is a professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning at Vanderbilt University. She has served as principal investigator on several grants funded by the National Science Foundation, Carnegie, and the Spencer Foundation. She has 61 publications, and the most recent book, which she co-authored, is titled Teacher Learning of Ambitious and Equitable Mathematics Instruction, a Sociocultural Approach. So we are very excited to have with us today, Lonnie Horn. Thanks, Mona. Nice to be here. And hi, John. (laughs) <laughs> and hi. Well, again, thanks for being here. We can't wait to dig in. Um, but first, tell us, tell us a little bit about your mathematics story. How, how did you arrive at your current work? There's so many different versions of this story that I could tell. And I, um, I've been trying to figure out which version would be best to share with you and your audience. But um, basically, the sh- sort of a thumbnail version is that I was a kid who loved puzzles, loved games, loved doing, um, thinking about numbers, but didn't like school math. And um, my when I got to high school, I had a algebra two teacher who when girls would ask questions, he would say, that's okay, you're just gonna be a housewife anyway. And when we pointed out that that was sexist, he, started to say, you're just going to be a house spouse anyway, but still only said it to girls. So um, he was also the one who taught calculus at my high school. And I was on track to take calculus, but did not want to endure another year of that. So I actually called colleges that I wanted to go to. And I said, listen, here's the situation. I cannot endure this, but I really like, I like you know, I want to show you that I'm a good student. I ended up taking computer science instead, which I'm kind of glad about that I did that. Um, But I got into college thinking that I was not a math person. I had a pretty damaged math identity um, and started out pre-med. When I started taking my, when it was time to take my required uh, math course, I signed up for the kind of calculus for poets course that my liberal arts college had. After the first class, the professor asked me to stay after, interviewed me briefly and was like, why are you not in the regular calculus class? And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. That's not for me. And he really wanted me to switch over to the regular calculus class. And I said, okay, I'll make a deal with you. I'll do that, but I'm gonna sit in the front row. I'm gonna ask you a ton of questions and you have to answer all my questions. And he said, okay, deal. So I ended up taking calculus, liking it enough to continue. And by after the second semester of calculus, that professor was a different professor said to me, "Um, I really want you to take linear algebra honors. You should really be a math major. So the, the, the moral of that story is here I was a kid who clearly had aptitude, passion, and interest in math, but school math had done so much damage to my own sense of um, competence in the content area that I got to college thinking that it wasn't for me. It turned out I had a great aptitude for it, became a math major. Um, once I really realized how much I had to offer and, and how much I brought to the content, I was like, wow, 
my education like really did me an injustice. And I bet there's other kids out there who've experienced different versions of the same thing. And so my passion became math education. And uh, one way to describe what I do as a math educator is I try to bring authentic, rich, fascinating, wonderful mathematics to kids to kind of move away from school math, which I think is kind of an anemic cousin of the beautiful content that some of us have an opportunity to get to know and explore as mathematicians. What a great, powerful story. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing when I said, okay, and cut. That was the best I, podcast you're I ever going to hear. I am sure that resonates with several of us. Um, I can tell you all kinds of lovely stories being the only female high yep. school math teacher in my yep. math department. Um, just very sexist comments. Um, however, what was powerful about your story is you had two very strong teachers that believed in you that allowed you to believe in yourself. And yeah. That, that is heartwarming. <laughs> I know. It, my, it turned out I was going to my undergrad at a time where there was an initiative and a lot of deliberate attention on increasing the diversity of the math majors. So I benefited from that because they were kind of on a little bit of a talent search and like who's being um, underplaced, undermatched, whatever mm -hmm. um, term you want to use. So they were they were looking for people, looking and they had their eyes open and were sensitized to that so that the pipeline could go the other direction than it usually goes. So I think there were a number of initiatives along those lines and I benefited from that. Lonnie, you know, your story strikes me because we have some similarities in that, though I wasn't, you know, going to be a housewife, which is appalling to hear that. <laughs> like there was this school math and then there was the other math. And I, and yeah. I, I fell in love with math, but it wasn't what I did in school. And that was something that was a point of contention for me is, is for a long time and not just my life, but as a math teacher early in my career. Um, you know, so I, that really resonates um, with me. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah, no, math is amazing. It is so cool and so fun. And it makes me really, really sad when, you know, my, my youngest is now a, a sophomore in high school. So, and I have a college age child and another who graduated. So I've done a lot of math over the years and school yeah. math. And it always made me sad when they'd come home with like what I called sad math. Like, oh, this is such a sad version of this. This is actually a really cool idea. Um, anyway. Yes. Well, I want to kind of, one of the reasons why we asked you to be on here is you had a very intriguing comp, uh, session at the conference. Yeah. I um, mean, it was about teacher learning. Yes. Um, but your session at the conference lifted up the idea that discussion and focus on best practices in math instructions might inhibit teacher learning. So tell our listeners, um, even if you weren't able to be at the conference, what did you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, I was being provocative. Um, oh, great. <laughs> but I was being provocative with a purpose that, so we had just finished a five-year study um, with teachers who were all committed to what's come to be called, you know, ambitious and equitable teaching along the lines of the things encapsulated in NCTM standards and so on, um, really trying to make this kind of rich mathematics reach more children in meaningful ways. Um, and the way that I do my work is I take sort of an anthropological view of teacher learning, which means that I kind of hang out a lot and listen and eavesdrop and record and talk to teachers. Um, so it's not like a survey study. It's not a um, interview only study. I actually hang out, get to know, and my team hangs out, gets to know teachers. And we do learning with them. Like we learn with them and we think about what's going on when they're learning, what helps them learn, what kind of inhibits their learning. And one of the things that was really interesting after we like were analyzing all of this data, and I don't even want to tell you how much data it was because it was bananas, but <clears throat> we had so many conversations that we were looking at with teachers and we noticed that the framing when we were sort of debriefing a lesson or talking about something that, that was challenging in their teaching that this language of best practices when it came up it wasn't very helpful very often and oftentimes kind of shut things down um because 
on a certain scale, we can talk about best practices, like at sort of a 10,000 foot le level, like we need to respect kids' ideas. We need to build our instruction on their ideas. We need to embrace multiple kinds of representations of ideas so that kids can have different entry points. Like at that really kind of large scale level that doesn't actually tell you what to do in the moment in your classroom, it's kind of more like values and, and aspirations than it is like oh my gosh, it's the end of the period. And this kid just came up with this like kind of wacky solution that actually has some really fascinating things to it. But I kind of want to wrap up my lesson, but I also want to honor their idea. How does that change when this is the first time this kid has spoken in two months? You, you know, like all those little judgments that we make. So when teachers would bring a kind of best practice framing to that kind of dilemma, it would shut down the deliberation of, huh, so what would happen if you went with, like, let's talk about the wacky idea. What's a way that you can kind of maybe like catalog it and pick it up in the next the next day, like just sort of all the different options um, that a teacher might have in that particular moment. Um, and when teachers would start to reach for best practices, the brainstorming would stop. So what the provocation was about in the name of my talk was that, yes, at a certain level, we kind of know what we're going for, but in the weeds, there's a lot of like thorny kinds of moments that there's actually not a right answer. It's more about like trade-offs and priorities and that making sense of those trade-offs and priorities is actually a really productive place to spend time, to debrief, to get feedback, to think through things, because I think it helps you next time you're in another thorny situation, which we know if you're teaching, it's gonna be tomorrow. Um, you know, you have a, a framework and a way of thinking about it and, and, and maybe a little bit less anxiety about, um, deliberating and and knowing that you may not get it perfectly right. And, and the framework of best practices, I think, leaves some teachers feeling like there is a right or wrong in those moments when really there's kind of a, eh, this, this part would be better, this part would be harder, no matter what, like of several good choices you could make in that moment would be. Yeah, so Lonnie, as you talk about right and wrong and best practices, and I think about best practices as a driving part of the conversation often um, about what should we be doing in a math classroom and so on. Um, I, I think that there's something that clearly that's misunderstood about best practices. So a question I have for you is, what do you think is misunderstood about best practices in math instruction or, or teaching and learning in general? I think there's a little bit of a fantasy. It's almost like a technical, like a technician's fantasy that if we could just sort of like, nailed down in almost like if then form what teachers should do in different scenarios maybe we could crack the code and then just sort of give that to teachers and anyone could teach reasonably well and i think that there are things that are kind of like that in teaching you know like we know you need to have routines we know you need to um have a positive culture we need in in your classroom we know that kids need to feel emotionally safe. There, there are certain kinds of baseline things that we know, but that don't necessarily tell you what to do day to day. Um, and then there's all this really interesting work that's been done on say instructional routines, right? So it's not that there's not a general generic kind of thing that we can learn from, but I think that the hardest parts of teaching are these kind of tricky thorny moments that I'm trying to describe where you're using an instructional routine and it breaks down in some fascinating way where if we're gonna take seriously the idea of honoring kids and their ideas, we can't just go, nope, next, you know? And uh, that's, that's tricky. And that's never gonna become routine because the different combinations of students that we get in our classrooms, just from a combinatorical perspective, right? It's never going to be exactly the same. There's like patterns we can start to ascertain, but 
you know, we, we've all had that one class that we remember and we're like, wow, that one, they really broke the mold with that group of kids, you know? And, and so there's always this, this sort of unpredictable element to teaching, which I think is, if you have the right attitude and you have the right support is part of what makes it fun and exciting, but it also makes it kind of break down that uh, technician's fantasy that if we can just sort of figure out what all the best practices are in all the right scenarios that it can become sort of this plug and play activity, um, which yeah. takes all the humanity out of it, honestly. Well, I mean, I think that's actually a well said there. <laughs> it's all as if we are, like you said, trying to crack the code, create a series of if-thens, and these are the technician responses. I often joke about having a silver bullet, like if there was right. one, right? But, but there isn't, and that it's a human endeavor, and there's thinking on the feet. And I really like how you talk about there's some big ideas or some general practices that shroud all of this, but there's a lot of you know back and forth and and, and maneuvering, um, and it's not just a clear set of steps. That's so um, it means a lot. Yeah, one of the things, and I've been doing a ton of work with elementary school teachers, and I I come into the word. Um, fidelity. Hmm. <laughs> it drives me crazy Yeah, because of what you're saying that teaching, and I wrote it down, is not a plug and play moment. Mm -hmm. Like you don't just plug and chug with a script. Mm -hmm. There are so many things and what you were just, the trade-offs and priorities piece is there's times when we have to diverge from that lesson, right? That you like based on something students are thinking or doing, That's right. we need to move around that. So, so knowing this, how does understanding this idea affect the role of leaders who are supporting teachers? Well, this is where actually, I'm glad you asked a leader question because I think that leaders need to be particularly sensitive to this. So the study that I told you about where we kind of came to this conclusion um, about what we called the baggage of the binary, that there's right, wrong kinds of teaching moves and choices to be made, <clears throat> which is fed by this best practices notion. Um, the number, so the teachers we were working with all had at least five years experience, some as much as 25 years of experience. So very, very seasoned educators. And the number of them who said, that nobody had ever been in their classroom except to evaluate them. Wow. So if we think about how people learn, just generically, everybody learning whatever skill you wanna learn, one of the most important things you need is feedback. So when you only are, the only feedback you get if that's how things are organized is the feedback from kids. Do they like a lesson? Do they not like a lesson? And, you know, that's not always the best gauge of, you know, because sometimes when you push kids out of their comfort zone, they're gonna be like, oh, miss, why do you have making us do this? You know, and there, so there's pushback that they can be giving you that may not be like feedback for your learning. It may not be that like, oh, asking this to asking students to do this is like the wrong move or something. It's more that you have to kind of give them more support in getting there or something. Um, and the other, the only adult form of feedback you get is when someone's sitting there with a framework checklist or whatever, you know, for 15 minutes in the back of your classroom. Um, I think that that kind of adds to this idea of like, how do we look at each other? How do we give each other feedback for learning, feedback for sense-making? How can we kind of take these thorny instructional moments and unpack them together with curiosity, right? And I think that if, if leaders developed and supported teachers in developing practices where observations weren't only about evaluation, I know that a lot of states and districts have um, you know, certain requirements of how many times new teachers are observed or whatever. And there's forms for administrators to fill out and so on. But that doesn't always typically give teachers the kind of feedback they need for their own personal growth and to meet their own goals as teachers to help them 
figure out the things they're trying to get better at. And so I think if there was a way that leaders could establish practices for um, those kinds of dialogues and that, that kind of curiosity, more of a notice wonder framework almost for thinking about teaching than like a here's how you did with this evaluation criteria, right? This is what you need to improve on. Because it was one lesson and probably only 20 minutes of one lesson. And, you know, you pick a random 20 minutes of any of my teaching, you might find something really not flattering from a framework perspective. You know, I was teaching a class right before this podcast and my technology broke down and we ended up... <laughs> anyway you know it just things happen right and and we know that that's just part of the deal so i think the other thing i'm going to add to what you're saying about the leaders is if we're only in the classrooms for evaluations that is a missed opportunity from a leader's perspective right that we need to go in to classrooms not to just evaluate but to learn I mean, some of my best professional learning as a leader has been when I've done like a lesson study with a group of teachers and we've watched kids and I've, and we've learned from the students a new way of, a new way of thinking or a new question. And like, that's the best learning that I can do as a leader. Now, granted, I was not their evaluator. Mm -hmm. However, as an evaluator, if you are the principal or an assistant principal, you can provide those opportunities from teachers to learn together and to be in each other's classrooms. Right. That's, that is equally important. Anyway, thank yeah. you. No, I think that's a really, really good point. And thinking about my work and working with coaches and thinking about the work that coaches do as well, um, makes me think about so much. Um, I have a question. Is there any specific best practice that you think is overly problematic? Well, whose best practices, right? Oh, I mean, good question. Because there's there's sort of a lot of things out there. I don't think there's. I haven't read the NCTM standards in a while. I don't. I can't think of anything in that that jumps out to me as like, oh boy, that one really gets misconstrued. I think there's other um frameworks out there <clears throat> that I'm not a fan of like I'm not a fan of token economies for mm -hmm. classroom management mm -hmm. um I'm not a fan of just sort of the behaviorist uh kinds of systems that have taken root in a lot of schools um I don't know who calls them best practices but somebody must like them because they sure do show up a lot <laughs> actually so, I'm glad you say that like sometimes we have to think about who's calling these best practices right right, right. And, and who positions it that way um yeah that's a good point I, you know um the popsicle sticks or the equity sticks as they're called yeah exactly what I would call equity and that's one of the ones that I really struggle with for a million yeah. reasons I won't get into right now yeah no I think you're right that those I've seen so here's that's where <clears throat> I I'm not trying to be um mealy mouth or whatever but I think that there's I've seen versions of those used in thoughtful ways and I've seen versions of them used where I agree with you and I would say the exact same thing, like what equity are we talking about here? <clears throat> so I was recently in a classroom where um, the the routine wasn't just, okay, do this, do work on these, like this warm up problem or this worksheet or whatever. And then we're gonna just call cold call basically kids using these popsicle sticks, but it was more of a think pair share. And then by table, um, pulling a popsicle stick. So there was a little bit of an accountability thing that all kids knew that it was possible that they would get called on. So they felt accountable, but it wasn't a cold call where suddenly someone's going to feel like shamed because they didn't have an opportunity to think about it. And also by calling by table, if you have a student whose first language is in English or you know, you might have opportunities for kids to work together to produce an answer. So that that one is like, okay, I see that. I see the benefit of that. And I think that the most important thing where where I get really upset when people call them equity sticks is when it is just straightforward cold calling mm -hmm. and kids do end up 
feeling that shame of like not knowing, like that is something I feel like we should avoid having kids experience in math class. And that goes back to what you were saying earlier around like best practice in itself. Um, so like there was good intentions, right. For the use of popsicle sticks, right. What, right. There was intentions. And so sure. that is shared with somebody and then it's taken, it might be taken out of context a little bit. And so yeah. what you just described with the, the teacher team you observed of them actually having the team, the student team talk about it and then having the accountability that there was part of that probably at the beginning of wherever this started. However, it gets lost in translation sometimes. And that- um, For sure. So that, I think it's just, it goes back to the idea that we have to, as a leader, we have to empower those we serve to make better decisions and to think about not just the practice itself, but the application of the practice and bring in all of the other pieces that we know are best in terms of student learning, right? That's, That's right. And, connection. Yeah. And I would add to that, Mona, that I've been in classrooms where so I think the metaphor I use for a classroom is it's an ecology, right? It's a whole like system, right? And so <clears throat> I've been in classrooms before where I could kind of go, oh, I remember when that was on trend and I remember when people were doing that and I went to that PD and it's almost like an archeological dig. You can sort of see the different sediment, sediment layers of rock of all these different things. So there's like vertical non-permanent surfaces and there's red, yellow, and green cups and there's this and there's that. And, but there's no like coherence about it. So it's almost like too many practices, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that that's, that's the other, I didn't talk about this when I was at NCSM, but it, that's the other thing of the focus. I'm not sure practice is the right grain size always for us to be discussing because classrooms really do function as an ecology. And so like taking the example of popsicle sticks, right? Popsicle sticks in and of themselves as equity sticks aren't inherently good or bad, but they can be used in ways that do students harm and they can be used in ways that hold students accountable mm -hmm. and mitigate harm, right? And so it becomes a different kind of conversation when instead of saying, what's a good practice, saying, what does this practice do? What are the potential harms that this practice can do? How can it fit in with the other things that are going on in my classroom, right? Um, does it contradict anything going on in my classroom? Because I've, <laughs> that's another example I had one time was a teacher who was doing a lot of cooperative learning stuff, but then also had this competition piece and I watched as the competition would undo some of the confidence that was um, had been kind of budding in some of the more hesitant students. Mm -hmm. It just smashed back down by the competition. So it's like, that's what I mean by it's an ecology, right? Like you think about what you introduce to your ecosystem and what might it interact with and what goals might it end up impeding or enhancing. So it's a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So my last question for you is what advice would you give to math leaders who are responsible and that their, their work of supporting teachers, like that is their responsibility. What advice would you give to them to help them on this journey? I'm going to go back to what I said earlier about trying a notice and wonder kind of framework for observations, um, especially when you're trying to give the kind of feedback that can support growth. So using John's example, I noticed you used popsicle stick. Um, can you tell me about what you're hoping that's gonna do for your classroom, right? And, you know, maybe the teacher says, well, it's really important to me that one student doesn't dominate all the conversation and that the quiet students have an opportunity to talk. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's something I think everyone here could get behind. That's great. Okay. Well, I noticed that when you called on Anthony, he turned bright red and I was a little bit concerned about how he experienced that. Let's talk about that. What did, how did you see that? You know, you know, Anthony better than I do, you know, 
and teacher can tell us about Anthony and, you know, maybe Anthony just blushes all the time. Anyone calls his name, but he really likes whatever, right? We can hear, but we can hear. So it's more of a dialogue rather than where we're, we're kind of going through a thinking process and a brainstorming process with the teachers so that they can then do their own sense making, right? Because ultimately we're not gonna be able to be there for every lesson for every moment. Right. So what we're trying to give them is not like, okay, here's your toolkit, go. It's more, here are some ways of thinking about teaching. Here are some ways of thinking about other kinds of moves you can make. Here are ways we can think about mitigating you know, maybe Anthony really was embarrassed. So what can we do to be more supportive of kids like him? Um, I think that if leaders took the stance of my goal is to help teachers think more productively about their instruction by thinking through some of these moments with them, I think that would be a great place for math leaders to grow. I agree. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just thinking, listening to you talk the whole time, I'm thinking this show, this podcast could have been an hour and a half and I have so many more questions for you. <laughs> yes. um, but um, I just want to say thank you. Wow. Like what a great ending to a great series thinking about what we do and what we might do differently and what we might do better. So thank you, Lonnie, for joining us today and, and really pushing my thinking about what is a best practice. Great. Yep. Awesome. Well, it was so great to be here. I really am so grateful for the work you all do. Thank you so much. We hope you have been inspired by this bold mathematics leadership conversation and will tune into our podcast series each month. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review. You can learn more about NCSM leadership in mathematics education and our upcoming professional learning events on the NCSM website at mathedleadership.org. You can also follow NCSM on Twitter at mathedleaders using the hashtag NCSMBold. Thanks again.